this is great to see a packed room, um, and it, I think it's just an indication of of uh, how how uh, timely a topic this is, and also um, how much Brookline cares. And this this is really really wonderful to see all of you. Um, a couple of more announcements before we get started. One is that uh, uh, you know you may have heard a rumor that we were offering refreshments. Uh, <laughs> we apologize if you did. Um, <laughs> we, we figured it would be much more practical to uh, invite folks to join us, to continue the conversation afterward at Orinoco, right down the street at 22 Harbor. So please do, uh, please do join us. The other is if you could silence your cell phone um, during the presentation, that would be great. So, uh, and before uh, I introduce our panel, I'd just like to point out a few of our incredibly devoted town staff and officials uh, who were delighted could attend. Uh, first, the transportation and engineering crew, Todd Corain, wave your hand, uh, Peter Ditto, and Dan Martin. Uh, from Economic Development and Planning, Andy Martineau, mm -hmm. great. Uh, Selectman Neil Wyshynski and Nancy Daly. Uh, uh, from the Transportation Board, Gus, Dreesen, and Pam, you around? Is Pam here? Yes. No. Okay. And uh, let's see, the Bicycle Advisory Committee, um, Wave your hands. Uh, and uh, the public transportation advisory. Uh, great. Uh, wonderful. Great to see all of you here. And uh, if I've forgotten anybody, uh, my apologies. So, our guests tonight are Steve Miller, Jackie Douglas, George Metzger, and Nick Jackson. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about them. But first, um, I thought I, would, I thought I would tell you something about our first two guests, who are both involved with a group called Liverpool Streets Alliance. And I thought by way of introduction, I would give a small bit of background uh, about where the name comes from, the name of the group, Liverpool Streets, uh, because the origin is so related to what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, Liverpool Streets is the name of a book that came out around 1980, written by an urban designer and planner named Donald Appleyard, who taught over here at MIT and at Berkeley. And over 10 years in the 1970s, Appleyard studied three streets in San Francisco for a 10-year period. The streets were chosen to be as identical as possible in every way except for the amount of traffic on them. And what he was able to show was that just the presence of cars uh, with the you know, envelope of danger they project around them and noise and pollution can really decimate the quality of life in our neighborhoods. And up until that point, we had numbers and statistics on injuries and deaths ca caused by cars. But Appleyard and his team, the revolutionary thing that they came up with were, were these diagrams that enabled us to see beyond the specific numbers of people being hit or killed and see that there was another way to measure the impact of traffic on our communities. Uh, now this chart shows the, uh, the social interaction on these three different streets. Uh, one that's heavily trafficked, another with light traffic, and one sort of in between. So uh, now, what it shows is the lines on the chart show uh, uh, where people are living on these streets, have friends or acquaintances, and each line's a connection from one person to another. The data show uh, where folks tend to, the, I'm sorry, the dots show where folks tend to gather. And one of the things he showed was that a, a light traffic street help knit a neighborhood together with lots of social ties, as you can see over here. And a heavily trafficked street can, can really rip it apart uh, with few, where, because fewer social ties are created. Now the fact that the amount and nature of traffic on a street can determine how many friends you have is really of huge significance. Now since then, we've learned a lot of things about the design of a street and how that and how we get around can affect can have impacts that are just as powerful. 
And that's what our panelists are going to be talking about tonight. So first, I'd like to introduce Steve Miller, who's exec executive director of the Healthy Weight Initiative at the Harvard School of Public Health and a founding board member of Liberal Streets Alliance. He started Boston's Hub on Wheels Bicycle Festival. How many know about Hub on Wheels? All right. Um, and continues to advise the Boston Bike Program. He's a gubernatorial pedestrian advocate appointee on the state's Bike and Pedestrian Advisory Board and a member of the state's Healthy Transportation Advisory Committee. He publishes a blog on transportation, health, and livable communities that I highly recommend. And Steve's published four books on public policy, been uh, hosted a radio discussion show, and served as a commentator on the National Cable Network. Steve's going to give us an overview of Complete Streets, what it is, as well as how, as well as how it fits in with related concepts, so, such as shared space, placemaking, and context-sensitive design. Uh, let's give a warm welcome to Steve. into the very physical structure of the road. Here's a good example. We all know that when you drive down a street full of potholes, you go slower. 
It's not because the traffic sign says speed limit 30 miles per hour. The road says speed limit 15, and that's what you do. I drive over the Longfellow Bridge, I used to before it was being repaired. It's like this mini highway between the shores. I'm very careful, and I know every time I got to the crest of that bridge, I was going 45, 50 miles an hour. Why? It wasn't I didn't decide to do it, it's just the road calls you forward. And it does, right? We drive at the speed that the road allows us to feel comfortable going, in general. There's always, you know, it's, there's limits, and there's other times, but in general. So a complete street is one that builds into the structure of the road reminders that you're not alone, that there's other people there. Third, it's about place making. Our streets have been given over to a single type of use for free for years. We all pay taxes. And in fact, a good percentage of our transportation costs come from our property and sales and general income tax, way over and beyond the gasoline tax that we always think is paying for. We all contribute to that street. And in fact, streets are the largest single physical asset owned by almost every municipality. Our largest single public access, uh, asset. And we don't use it. We don't get access to it unless you're driving a two-ton tank. So part of what Complete Streets is about is saying this is public space. And we can use it for what the public thinks is most appropriate. That might be letting cars go as fast as they want or as slow as they want. It might be for a street fair. It might be for a concert. It's public space. There's no God-given right that automobiles are there. We decide. Third, that's the third point. And the last is, and this goes back to the name that our organization has of livable streets. Transportation, the least important thing about it is moving people and things from one place to another. The least important thing about transportation is travel. The most important thing is that it dominates and shapes land use, friendship networks, the environment, the kind of business that can thrive, the livability and sustainability of your community. That's why transportation is so powerful. We think it's about cars and people and trucks. Not, it's about that, but it's about the impact of that on everything else. So, oh, that's this one, okay. So if you think about all these things, livable streets, using streets as a lever for livability, sustainability, means they have to be multimodal, they're for everybody. They have to be green, they have to take the environment into context. A straight, ordinary, traditional street is a poison spewing situation. We need faster, better cars, we need better cars, cleaner cars. We need to think about complete streets as green, as smart. There's new technologies that are changing the way we understand traffic flows and congestion. I'm not just talking about Uber, I'm talking about sensors, a whole bunch of stuff. We have to be smart. That's complete too. It has to be healthy. And not just physically healthy, but socially healthy. If our street environment doesn't make us feel happy to live there, it's missing the, the goal. And finally, fun. We'll get back to that. So, here we go. so transportation is a pathway to livability. This is an actual street. I think it's in Seattle. Nick, you remember? Portland. 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 Sorry. Thank you. And the neighbors were tired of cars racing through the street. Now, it turns out if you narrow the lanes, People slow down. It's like having bumps in the road. Visually, physically, the road tells you to slow down. But it also turns out, if you have visual excitement, distractions on the road, people slow down. Okay. I'll come back to that. So these neighbors went out and painted the intersection. And the cars slowed down. And there's a great lesson in this one, and that's this if you plan for cars and traffic, you'll get cars and traffic. If you plan for people and places, you get people and places. That's from Fred Kent, Project for Public Spaces, and it's the way you get from here to a complete street.
is thinking in those terms. So here's some examples of what's not a complete streak. Okay. <laughs> I keep thinking one of these is my mother. So, there's some, I love this, right? Yes. I'll meet you at the end of the sidewalk. This is not a complete street. But this is not a complete street either. It may have a bike lane, it may have a bus lane, it may have great sidewalks, but it's not complete because there's no people. A street that has no people might as well be a cemetery, but no one's going to visit it even there. So you really want to go and make it a living, living part of your city. You own it. You want to make it useful. It's no accident, and it's not surprising, that you survey pedestrians and you say, what's your biggest complaint about the roads, about traveling on your foot? It, some variation of what we would call complete streets is missing. All right, come on. There it is. And bicyclists, too. I mean, same thing. Now, the reason these two, these two groups are really important is that they're the canaries in the, in the mind here. They're the most vulnerable. So we've got to keep thinking about who is most vulnerable. In the business world, where I spent a number of years, we used to say our hardest customers were our most important customers. We please them, we please everybody. In streets, if you safeguard the most vulnerable, you make it better for everybody, whether that's young or elderly. Complete streets is not a new idea. This, this is a complete street. <laughs> they didn't call it that. They called it a slum. But it was a complete street. It had everything going on. So let me show you a couple of before and after. We'll go from non to give you a sense. I'm going to run through these. I can keep up. Okay. Bad. Good. Bad. Good. Some patterns here, right? Trees, multimodal, bike lanes. We'll get back to even better than bike lanes. Sidewalks, and lots of stuff going on where pedestrians, people, stop, talk, and gather. Here's another one. Bad, good. And what's amazing about this, this is real. This is a real photo. Here's another one. The important thing about Street, complete streets, though, is it's not just heavy downtown streets. Complete streets are also about quiet residential streets. And it can happen without enormous expense or activity. This is a complete street. There's room for pedestrians. A bicyclist can ride down the middle. A little kid on a bike could ride down the middle. And if properly signed, you could probably have your kids play baseball on the, on the street and not be scared. Okay. Here we go. Oops. Well, the previous sign says it's consistent with uh, federal law. This sign says it's consistent with state law. This is not a radical idea. State and federal rules and regulations basically call for complete streets, even though in practice it's hard to get there. Chances, this is another one from the state. The Transportation Reform Act, the Healthy Transportation Compact. I serve on the State Advisory Committee on this. This is what we're looking for. We are looking for ways, and Nick Jackson will talk about this later, the only way we're going to get there is if people like you and us push forward. There's so much inertia and momentum to keep what we've got. There's a lot of cars out there. So here's some thoughts. Here's a picture, I think Scott used this on one of the brochures, of a complete street. Here's another one. And here's another one. And what I like about this last one is especially the places for people to sit. By the time some of us get to walk downtown, you're tired. And a lot better to sit there and talk to your friends than it is to have to keep moving on because you're worried about getting run over in the intersection. Now, the key thing, and I'll come back to this again, is controlling speed. You want to have facilities for everybody? But the only way it works is if you slow down cars, and why? Look at the graph. Car hits you going 40 miles an hour, you're dead. But if you cut the speed in half, you cut the fatality rate. I don't know what the percentage is, but it's huge, down to 5%. That's the key fact. If you remember nothing else, those two things, room for everybody, speed. 
Here's one way to do it. Put chicanes, little bumps. Or you put a little mini roundabout, it's called a moderate roundabout, not one of our Cape Cod circles, you know. Little. People can drive around it, but you gotta slow down. It doesn't impede traffic, it just slows it. Here's another bump, speed bumps. I happen to love speed bumps. I know plow people hate them, but most of the country is able to do it and have heavier winters than we do. And if we're gonna have bumps or bump outs, why not do it at intersections? Why not have the intersection in the middle of the road, where car, in the middle of the block, where cars are just coming from one direction instead of at the corner where they're coming in four directions? Here's another one. Bump out with a nice broad zebras. This is a raised crosswalk. It tells cars you are entering pedestrian space. What if we had raised sidewalks across driveways and across minor side roads? So that the car coming was entering your space instead of you having to run through theirs. And every time they go to that bump, they remember, slow down. Here's a raised intersection. The entire intersection has been raised. There used to be worries from the fire departments that this would make it harder to get through. It turns out if you bump out the corners and raise the intersection, it makes it easier to get through because you've got no one parking in the corner blocking your turn. Another example here where it should be good for kids. I'm having trouble following. Okay, here's another device. You have a one-way street for cars. Brooklyn already has one of these. I use it almost every day, but it's two-way for bikes. Bikes take up three feet, they weigh 20 pounds. They are not a major hindrance to traffic. The opposite is not always true. But here's another way to think about complete streets. This is a complete street. Now this particular style is called shared space. What you do is you have flat pavement, and you basically say to anybody, you can be here, but you gotta be more protective of everyone else than you are of yourself. So there's a car in this picture, there's a bicycle, there's people sitting outside. Think of a European plaza translated into a street. And if that looks a little too much, this is Harvard Square. This is one of the streets in Harvard Square. Flat edge to edge, with bicycles, cars, pedestrians, and they have concerts here too. That's a complete street. Here's one way to think about bicycle facilities. You can, and also where do you find space for it? Very often, roads that are four lanes can be cut to two or three with a turning lane in the middle, three down to two. On the right side, here they've done it across one of their bigger streets. Here is a marked uh, bike lane. Let me see if I can keep this moving here. And this is a protected corner, and I'm, I don't have a cycle track. Here it is. Separation, I talked about separate roads. This is a bike road, and if you notice the green space next to it to catch the stormwater and to increase the environment. So here's some more pictures of cycle tracks, and another one, and this is the best. This is where you really have separate. Slow route, fast route, both together. And while we're talking about, let's make sure the bus people are protected as well, and that cars back in so they can drive out of parking lots seeing who's coming. And I'll end with, Remember, streets are not complete until you have fun. This is parking day, and Jackie over here is going to speak next. Actually, was one who brought it to Boston. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, let me introduce our next speaker. Jackie Douglas is the, um, and I should say before, before we go on, that uh, we will have plenty of time at the end if speakers sit to their time for questions, answers, and comments. And we'll, we'll bring all the speakers up, up here uh, uh, after, after each of them has, has done their thing for that. So, uh, so please stick around. Jackie is the executive director of Livable Streets, which is a member-based organization working to create safe streets and vibrant communities, making the Boston region a better place to live, work, and play. Jackie recently 
uh, served on the Green Ribbon Commission Transportation Working Group and Mayor Walsh Transition Team, uh, Transportation and Infrastructure Working Group. She's currently serving on the Boston Urban Mobility Plan Advisory Group and Boston Climate Action Steering Committee. In 2011, Jackie was awarded National Advocate of the Year by the National Alliance for Walking and Biking. And Jackie's gonna talk about trends and driving forces behind the, the uh, Complete Streets uh, movement and uh, s some of the benefits as well, the work that Google Streets Alliance does, and what can we do in Brookline. Please give a warm welcome to Jackie Douglas. <laughs> Hi everyone, good evening. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm no longer a Brookline resident, but I used to live in Brookline, uh, right near Coolidge Corner on Beacon Street. And currently, I commute through Brookline every single day. I live in Jamaica Plain neighborhood in our offices in Cambridge. So every day, at least twice a day, I'm going through Brookline as well as coming here for numerous different reasons. So thank you for having me. Um, so as Scott said, I'm going to talk about why Complete Streets Now, why, why this buzz, um, and the benefits to Brookline. Um, now what? Expanding off of what Steve has shared, some other concepts around complete streets and different facets of it. Uh, share a little bit about what Livable Streets does um, and what you can do. So we know that people love to be outside and around other people, naturally social creatures. This is actually a street in Copenhagen that once was all for cars um, that was turned into a space for people. Um, and as Steve said, the majority of our public space um, is our streets um, and this is what many look like. This is right in Medford. And as a result, we see a whole lot of this. This is congestion in Boston. And there's a lot of unintended health consequences. Um, public health issues um, with inactivity because it's just not inviting and people aren't outside. Or we're sitting in traffic. Or we're the consequences of being around pollution from automobiles. Um, and this theme of safety um, and speed, there is no reason why this car should have you know, flipped over on Commonwealth Avenue by the BU Bridge. No one should be going fast enough um, in an area where that is even possible. Um, we have a lot of environmental issues, air pollution, thinking about climate change and climate change resiliency and, and what and greenhouse gas emissions. We have unintended consequences around social issues. <laughs> And we're raising children to fear going out in the street. We're keeping them inside, saying, don't go out because the street is unsafe and don't play in the street. And we hear it time and time again. Economic issues, the real cost of driving, just what it means for people to not just buy a car, but parking and insurance and maintenance and realizing more and more the true cost day to day versus just you think about it one time, but again, what does that mean every day for people's livelihood and ability to live in their community and support local businesses and thrive? We have mobility issues. Um, this is Chris Hart, one of our board members. Um, if you can tell, his front wheel is about a half a foot off of the sidewalk. Um, we have this picture again, which I love. Steve and I use it both in all of our presentations. Um, and things like this, where you know the safe space to walk for families is in the shoulder. And as a result, we have a lot of design issues. Um, this is an issue. People bicycling on sidewalks. My perception? Why wouldn't they? There's no other safe space for them to be, so they're gonna default to the sidewalk. And so how do we start to rethink transportation and how do we design our streets to better accommodate people that benefits everyone, driving, people biking, people choosing to walk? Or we have, uh, this looks like me most days, weaving through traffic and trying to navigate the streets. Or the infamous sidewalks to nowhere. And my personal favorite, the most attractive bus stop in the world. <laughs> because here, what this signifies to me when I see this, and when I see people standing at bus stops with no shelter and no protection and no nothing, it just says, 
you don't want to be there. It's not attractive, it's not convenient, it's great on a sunny day when you have the time to wait, but there's nothing about this that says, you know, come, ride the bus. And we ultimately have a space issue. We have a growing population and we have a growing move of people moving back to urban centers and communities like Brookline because of all the benefits of community and proximity to jobs and services and good and great education. But this is 50 people in cars, 50 people in buses, and 50 people on bikes. And so we have to ask ourselves, how do we move people around efficiently and effectively through our city and around our city and so there's this assumption uh, you can solve congestion with more lanes and parking. And the reality is, this is one of my favorite quotes, widening a road to solve congestion is like widening your belt to solve obesity. <laughs> That's good. And as Enrique Penulosa says, traffic jam is an indication that a road is ripe for public transit. And so starting to think that congestion is actually not an issue, it actually means people want to be here, there's something that people are going to or from. Um, but then again, how do we then say, how do we move people around efficiently you know, through our city? And as a result, we're seeing a lot of amazing benefits. So we have all these unintended consequences and all these issues that have come around when the planning pendulum swung in the 50s, designing our streets for cars and only thinking about how to move cars and and now we're seeing this, this flip and this switch to complete streets. And we're starting to see data and the benefits. So one thing is safety in numbers. We're seeing that as you build the big yellow bars or as you build bike facilities and you build bikeways, whether it's bike lanes or separated bike lanes, you're seeing an increase in people using them and choosing to bike. And likewise, you're also seeing a decrease in crash crashes, both injuries and fatalities. And we're seeing these studies come out, this is Cambridge, right across the river, um, and in cities around the world. We're also seeing a lot of the economic benefits of sustainable streets, which I know we'll hear more about next. Um, but I share this as another, like what it means for local businesses, and more and more studies and more local business owners realizing that their clients are coming by foot and by bike and by transit, and people driving are, are not necessarily stopping or they're going through. Or me personally, I know that when I'm biking home, I'm more inclined to make quick stops because I don't have to worry about you know, parking and, and other costs. And then it's also good for employers um, because there's all these studies coming out about the employee happiness and productivity depending on how people get to work. And this is really huge because a lot of companies now in the Boston region are thinking about this actively and figuring out how do we engage our employees on this subject? And how do we promote people getting to work in different ways? Um, and then as a result, it's making employees happier, healthier, and there's a lot of studies. So we have this trend because of these issues. Um, there's another part of this that con consumers are driving light um, by choice. And so it's, it's to all these points I just spoke to. And in Massachusetts, we're seeing this huge decrease in miles driven. We're seeing less motor vehicles registered in the city. Meanwhile, the population is increasing. So we're seeing this great trend, and I couldn't help but put this picture of your new neighbors. Um, <laughs> Tom, Brady and Giselle who are moving to, <laughs> to Brookline. I don't know what your opinion is about it, but Long story short is it's also just becoming more mainstream and it's not just about people in you know, spandex or one quarter cohort of you know, people, but you know, how are people um, of all walks of life. So maybe they're in the room tonight and thinking about this stuff too. Um, so now what? Complete streets. Maybe all streets should look like this. <laughs> Um, but just another layer of complete streets is we can't forget about public transit. And we also can't take it for granted that we have public transit. The system we have is amazing, but it's a backbone. But we need more support, more funding, and more everything to, one, keep it running, two, maintain it, and also expand service to make all these possibilities an option. Because people need an option to be able to choose okay, I'm gonna walk there, I'm gonna take the bus there, then I'm gonna pick up a zip car and go here, and like think about all these different ways. 
And one of the future things that we talk a lot about is buses, um, which is usually a symbol of pain, uh, speaking to the picture before, um, and a status symbol, and how do we start to make them sexy? And we have amazing new tools, um, like Catch the Bean, Catch the Tea, and Catch the Bus that tells you when it's coming, so no longer it's, it's a, you know, a hassle or inefficient. Um, and we're also seeing other infrastructure improvements about thinking about how you can create innovative bus stops and bus rapid transit and designated bus lanes to start to prioritize moving people more efficiently so that a bus that's moving so many more people isn't stuck in traffic but can actually move more people more efficiently. Or bus stops like this where you don't have to wait to pay, everyone can get on at the same time and get off and you have a shelter um, much more attractive. And to support that, things like the bike network plan, um, and Brookline has its own, so I'm excited to see that funded um, and actually implemented to help connect the dots. And then it's also about the devil in the details, and so these little design details too to make these transitions easy of, you know, getting onto transit and making these connections. And it's also about having fun. So I'm going to wrap up quickly with a couple quick things on what does livable streets do. Um, and how you can guys can take the next step. Um, so Livable Streets is thinking about all these different facets, all these different modes, working with both government officials, partner organizations, and individual citizens. Um, we work to inspire a vision, just you know, getting people excited, people, businesses, government. Uh, this is us with government and elected officials. This is us putting on a mayoral uh, forum, um, having events, and having things like parking day. Um, building partnerships is critical, and coming to this event and being invited was so inspiring because there were so many groups sponsoring it, and so much energy to think about all these different connections. And so this is an example of us signing letters all together, how, um, and how wonderful it is to have all these groups in Brookline to be able to do that too. Um, empowering communities is huge, so giving people the tools, we have host some design charrettes, um, and also let people know about what's happening in their own neighborhood, especially if there's a code when they sign up for our newsletter, we can tell them what's happening. And ultimately, creating change on our streets. Um, we're proud of our first win when we won the first mile bike lane in Boston on Commonwealth Avenue, but that was only step one. Over the last couple of years, we've had our Better Bridges campaign uh, to turn things like this, the Longfellow Bridge, into this. Um, it's under construction right now, and this is what it'll look like from Boston to Cambridge on that side. Um, also winning improvements to the BU Bridge. And I want to thank everyone in the room um, who helped make this extra book, Brookline connection that I use um, every day. Um, if you know what I'm talking about, thank you. And if you don't, I encourage you to ride a bike down Essex Street and then go over the BU Bridge and use the new little connection. Um, we have our Neighborhoods Not Highways campaign, thinking about how do we redo outdated overpasses, thinking about if you have all this space, what can you do with it? I mean, our streets are, you have to look, start looking at them as like an empty canvas, and then what do you want to paint and for whom? And visions for new corridors to re-knit our communities. Um, we launched a Safer Streets campaign this year, and another thing we're working on is our Greenway Links initiative to reconnect all of our amazing greenways. And so I couldn't help but put this picture of the Route 9 crossing between the Jamaica Way and River Way, which is just a great symbol of things that we're working towards. Of some of these pictures of what's not a complete street, you can say, oh, that's not here. And then I look at this and say, it is here. It's in our backyard. And what are we all going to do to improve it? You're so that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so 8 to 80, we want to see people of all ages, of all abilities out on the street. We want to see their faces. We don't want anyone to be inside because they don't feel safe or they have to fear the street. And lastly, just to wrap up, um, I mean, again, there's so much energy in this room. It's really incredible that there's so many groups and so many people from different you know, facets of you know, Brookline community coming together. Um, I want to quickly, I thought about, you know, different things leading into this of like, okay, take the next step. You came here tonight to learn more, now what? And it's, you know, talk to three people, friends and neighbors about what you heard tonight. 
um, sign up for Hubway or hop back on your bike. Um, get involved with any one of the Brookline organizations that were here and livable streets. Um, there's just an immense amount of like task forces and committees in Brookline, so if you're not already part of one, which sounds like most of you all are, um, get involved or go to those meetings. Don't underestimate how important it is to like voice your opinion too, not just when you have a complaint, but also when you're really happy about something to reinforce that change and also thank you know, government officials and people working on it. Writing letters to the editor, um, you know, local businesses getting parklets and bike parking. Um, there's so many different things. Um, but I'll, I'll end with that, and I look forward to hearing your questions to dive into some of more of this in detail. So thank you. Thank you, Jackie. That was awesome. And yes, uh, we do have a gazillion committees uh, you, you can pick and choose from in Brookline. And one of them, in fact, is looking for new members to join the uh, Public Transportation Advisory Committee, Abby. Go see Abby after this, at, at the end of this event. She, she needs you. Um, now, our next speaker, George Metzger, uh, has been a principal of the architecture firm HMFH since 1974. He's also president of the Central Square Business Association, which represents the business and property owners of Central Square. And, and that's one of the main reasons why we asked him here, is because he's gonna talk about uh, the complete street's impact on commercial districts and local business, as well as Central Square's experience. Um, in the late 1990s, George co-chaired an advisory committee that recommended significant changes in the Central Square streetscape to make a more pedestrian-friendly environment. And many of you are familiar with, with uh, Central Square today and what it used to look like. Um, he's also chaired the Zoning Advisory Committee that advises the Cambridge Planning and Zoning Board about special permits and variances for development projects there. And two years ago, the Business Association engaged in a community visioning process for the future, future of Central Square, uh, resulting in a report calling for more density, mixed use development, and more pedestrian and bicycle accommodations. Uh, George has a really uh, a strong connection to Brookline as well, uh, which you may not know about. He, uh, at HMFH, he directed the Brookline Town Hall renovation right next door, and he's currently principal in charge of the Devotion School Reconstruction and Expansion Project. Please give a warm welcome to George Metzger. Thank you, Scott, for that introduction. Um, and I'm not gonna answer any questions on the Devotion School Project. <laughs> <laughs> I go to enough meetings in Brooklyn. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here. I am, in the words of one of those good NPR programs, I'm the odd man out in this group. Uh, I'm not an advocate uh, or representative, well I am an advocate, I'm not a representative of an advocacy group around uh, green streets or alternative transportation and all those things. Um, so I'm going to really talk a little bit and hopefully a very short bit about experiencing advocacy and uh, some of the issues that we're really talking about tonight that we both want to solve and that we want to see. Uh, it is true that I've been very active in community affairs in Cambridge for a long time. Um, I am also, I forgot to put in my little bio, I am on the Cambridge's Transit Advisory Committee and we cover the full spectrum of not just transit but how people move around the city and how these things need to be coordinated. I come to this also as someone who grew up in an inner city neighborhood in Buffalo, New York, which is a really neighborhood-oriented city, much like we have here, uh, although different in its own way. And so living in mixed-use, transit-oriented, green neighborhoods where you can walk to the corner store or you can get transit to go to school is something that I assumed was normal. Um, and then I went to other places and realized it wasn't. Um, but let me talk a little bit about um, Central Square, which is what I have been asked to do, and I will start this by saying uh, I'm not a content expert, I'm just a user expert, like all of you, frankly. Um, 
The information I have tonight is not mine. It is provided to me by other folks in Cambridge who put me up to this, and I'm happy to share it. So I, uh, I cannot defend its origin, but I really can defend the common sense of this and all the other really interesting things people have been talking about tonight. In Central Square, as was mentioned, uh, 24 years, of, 20 years ago, we engaged in a whole streetscape improvement project. We didn't know to call it street, uh, Green Streets then. We didn't really know what to call it except common sense. Central Square, uh, Mass Avenue, as you may remember, was very wide. It had a parking on both sides, at least two lanes of traffic in both directions, and it was a through affair through the middle. And as a result, it was two lines of linear commercial life uh, on opposite sides of the street, and the twain never met. Uh, for most people, it was rather treacherous to get across the street. We hired a traffic engineer of all sorts. Of, you know, of, hard to imagine a traffic engineer, but he recommended we actually take traffic off, take lanes down, add seven feet to each side of the street, add another row of trees, add benches, and make it people friendly. So we, I think, successfully tipped the scale between pedestrians and traffic in Central Square. Now, I've lived in my neighborhood for many years, and I have a neighbor right here in the audience, uh, and one of my neighbors was a bus driver. He didn't think that was too cool because he said, boys, it's like, it's hellish getting around those narrow little corners in Central Square now. And I reminded him that Central Square really wasn't for buses. Buses are for people, and so is Central Square. Um, he's no longer driving a bus, uh, but not because of that. In Central Square also, um, so what I am an expert in is the consumer of urban systems. I actually walk to work. Uh, my, I, I like to say I don't have a car. My family has one car and it's a Prius. But I walk to work. I am very fortunate to be able to live within walking distance. I have a fold-off bicycle under my desk that I use to travel around. I got here tonight by a zip car. And today I do what I mostly do when I have to go out of the office for business. I use the red line. So these systems are there. We are quite lucky in Boston, uh, even though we like to criticize them so much. But we have these systems in place, and how we improve them and how we integrate them is really the challenge that I think all of us face. Central Square, as was already mentioned by Jackie, um, about Cambridge in general, has experienced incredible growth in uh, bicycling traffic into the square. Um, and it's quite interesting that this tremendous growth has been accompanied at the same time by a tremendous growth in uh, sidewalk restaurants and cafes, and there are conflicts in those things because they can't all occupy, we want them both, and they can't all occupy the same spaces. Um, and it is interesting as part of looking into increasing bicycle accommodations in Cambridge, the, Cambridge has two groups that work on this. There is a transportation planning group within community development, sounds good, and there's also the implementers who work in the Cambridge's uh, Traffic and Transportation Planning Department. They're sort of the, the doers and the other people are the thinkers. Most of the time, they're on the same page or they're getting closer. It used to be, we joked, that when we were doing this original uh, renovation of the Central Square, we wanted to know why we couldn't have crosswalks everywhere. And the then traffic planner on the doer side, the people who really worried about parking spaces and all that, and traffic flow said, over my dead body, will we ever have one of those things that you put out in the middle and say, stop for pedestrians? Well, about three years later, we started doing them, and they're everywhere, and they really change the nature of the city and our neighborhoods. Uh, in a survey uh, through Cambridge, Tra um, the Cambridge, uh, one of the departments they were doing, I guess it was the transportation department, in anticipation of putting in additional bike uh, accommodations and, and parking areas, they found that six to through a survey, six to ten percent of retail customers in Cambridge travel by bicycle. That seems astounding to me, but in fact there are a tremendous amount of bicycles. As was mentioned, the number of bicycles in Cambridge have increased tremendously. Three times over the last decade. Uh, increased by three times over the last decade. And you can see the shortage of bicycle accommodations in Central Park. Bikes are locked to anything that stands still. Uh, probably including other bikes many of the time. Um, also, uh, in 2011, in anticipation of the installation of the Hubway bike system, um, they did another survey that indicated um, 
they did a survey of, of, of parking uh, accommodations around, this, uh, around Cambridge. Cambridge is known for not having an awful lot of parking. Central Square is the one place that actually does have a lot of parking if you can find it. So Cambridge engaged in a proposal to, um, well we had, done, we had already done some experimental things like uh, parklets and bike spaces where we take them up for a day and people get to use them for alternative things. And then the city came to us and explored the idea of taking away some parking spaces and putting in bicycle corrals. As the president of the business association, they came to us and they said, we have this plan, what do you think about it? And we did an informal, admittedly, canvassing of our members, primarily the retail members who are the shopkeepers on the ground floor. They, they had no problem with it whatsoever. I was totally astounded. In fact, they are pretty much aware of the fact that people walk and bike into Central Square to do a lot of shopping, um, and they did not have a problem with taking out one, one parking space. They would have a problem if you took out a, um, a loading zone, however, of course, because that accommodates uh, part of the uh, necessities of their business. But they understand, uh, unlike many places when you raise the issue of taking away a parking place, that that was one parking space or a few in Central Square was not critical. Okay, so let me just take you through some very uh, quick slides. This is the proposal that Cambridge came up with to install in selected areas around the city um, bicycle corrals, as they are. And where's the dot here? Laser. Okay, so this is basically Harvard Square. This is Central Square. My house is right up here. Uh, this is, uh, I'm sorry, this is Central Square. This is the other end of Central Square, which is now no longer a square, it's a linear uh, mall. And this is Kendall Square over here. So the city had identified a number of places where they would try to do this. And we did it for the first time last year, and we've done it again. I have a number of slides that I will uh, do here. Here's a typical one where uh, the Cambridge is using. It's only in the summer, uh, it's not in the winter, where a parking space is taken away and replaced. And uh, some studies have been done to see at different times of year and times of day even, if you can read up at the top, how well they're being used. So this shows how they identified taking away spaces and putting in uh, uh, these corrals. 14 bicycles are accommodated in the space of one car in this system. So, uh, and as you can see, Often there are more than that. Have you ever seen the great parking garage in Amsterdam uh, that has about 10 times as many bikes as it was supposed to? That's, that's what we see here. Let me see what we're getting. I didn't uh, preview all these slides, so I won't uh, impose them on you longer than I have to. But you can see this is a demonstration of how popular they are. So taking away one car, what's it doing here? Uh, in, in its place come uh, umpteen bicycles, probably, uh, you know, maybe 20 even in some places. These are, uh, this is in my neighborhood, this last one before that was in Central Square. And then this uh, is down by the, uh, the Harvard Bridge, the Longfellow Bridge that's being, or is that the Harvard Bridge being worked on in Kendall Square. Here are different times of the year, so there was a lot of work done to document the use of these and how popular they were and how popular they were at different times of the year. This is in October. And I'm sure most of you have noticed, and maybe many of you are, that uh, this year in particular, in the last two years, people bicycle all year round. The snow is not an issue for uh, some of the most ardent bicyclists. Now there were some areas, and this happens to be in Central Square um, in front of the Middle East, down on the, on the eastern end of Central Square, where that bike space was not particularly popular. So the city has been doing this kind of very regular observing of its use. And then uh, in various locations where the uses are light or not consistently heavy, they've gone through a process, that's what this slide was supposed to be for, of identifying where the bike space was and moving it down uh, to the left there on the slide, closer to the intersection, closer to where there perhaps are more people. That red building is where the City Hall Annex is, where a lot of city employees are, and perhaps where more people will 
find it convenient to bike to work. I'm not convinced that moving in a few spaces makes much difference whatsoever. The cyclists are there or not. And in Central Square, we're actually looking to identify some new spots and move uh, spaces around depending on where they go. The great thing about this is that it's totally flexible. You can have a corral in one area one year, you can move it to another area in another year, and you can really site it in places that it meets the best needs. I think that's the end of my slides. Let me just close uh, by, not by just restating that uh, what I found quite surprising was that there was really no issue around taking up um, spaces. And in addition, I don't have any data on this, but there is research, and uh, Jackie has some very good ones also. But there was a study done in, uh, by Portland State University around um, uh, the incidence of, uh, well, the correlation between bicyclists and shopping. And it found that um, there's lots of statistics, but I think the important takeaway was that, that certainly pedestrians and cyclists um, shop, um, do much less shopping in any one visit. But for small and independent neighborhood kind of shopping, they shop much more frequently and they actually buy more than people who commute by cars to those kinds of commercial districts. So that kind of information for an area like Central Square, which is dominated by small independent retailers, uh, I think was very significant in telling in that uh, they understand, those retailers understand where their patrons are coming from and that cyclists and pedestrians actually are much uh, stronger supporters of local and independent businesses than automobile drivers. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Thanks, George. Uh, the audience will have a chance to uh, grill you on your story uh, in a little bit. Um, our next speaker is Nick Jackson, and he's the, the director of Tool Design Group's Boston, Massachusetts office, and that's T-O-O-L-E with an E, uh, has over 15 years of experience planning and designing sustainable transportation systems. A uh, major focus of Nick's work has been retrofitting constrained urban corridors to better accommodate all modes of travel. And recently, Nick led the development of uh, comprehensive new complete street guidelines for the city of Boston, which include a new system of street types and detailed roadway, sidewalk, and intersection design guides. He's going to tell you uh, a lot about that. Nick was involved in developing complete streets design guidance for the cities of Dallas, Texas, and St. Paul, Minnesota. And prior to joining Tool Design Group, Nick served as Deputy Director of the Active Transportation Alliance in Chicago, Illinois. So uh, Nick is going to talk about complete streets guidelines and concepts, get into a little more detail. And please give Nick a warm welcome. I would just talk to you, but um, I'm really boring without slides, so. <laughs> you want to see my slides. Um, yeah, I just want to reiterate what other folks have said. It's really, um, it's really exciting to be here tonight uh, with you all. Um, I feel like this is the beginning of something uh, for the town of Brooklyn. It's very exciting uh, for me to be a part of it. Um, I'll put the light here. Okay. Great. 
So I want to start off with this, uh, this image on the upper left, and I think it, uh, it speaks to uh, tonight's event. Um, we've heard a lot about some, very, some core principles of complete streets, and I'll talk about some of those. But it's also true that every town has its own personality. Uh, and the journey for you figuring out what complete streets means for Bookline is kind of be looking uh, at your own community, at yourselves, at your values, uh, and taking into some of these core principles uh, to figure out uh, what's right for you. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some stories from other communities. Uh, these, these are not meant to be prescriptive, but it's meant to kind of provide an illustration of how these concepts uh, have been implemented. Uh, so the, the, uh, the graph in the upper left shows kind of what I see as the three key players. You have the public agencies. Obviously, they are, um, they are at the core of any Complete Streets initiative. Then you have your professional community. You have your engineers, your planners, your urban designers. Uh, they're also an important part of the mix. Then you have uh, you, you have the neighborhoods, you have the residents, you have the business community, uh, and you have the advocates. And you all bring something important to the table when it comes to talking about complete streets. You have the experience, uh, the expertise, and local knowledge to help make complete streets a reality. So I'm excited again to be here tonight at uh, the beginning, beginning of that discussion. So I recently had the privilege to take a trip to the Netherlands. And when you hear about bicycling or complete streets, you hear talking about the Dutch a lot. I think one thing important to remember is that the Dutch have the safest streets in the world. Um, and they did not uh, do this overnight. It took 40 years of hard work, often contentious struggle, to achieve what they've achieved uh, today. But I'll put out there that it's worth that struggle. Uh, it is worth reducing and eliminating injuries uh, and deaths as a result of transportation on our streets. Um, this is a series of pictures I took one afternoon in the suburb of Utrecht called Putin. And what really struck with me um, was, again, we talked about this concept of 8 to 80. Um, here are children bicycling on their own. Um, they can do this because... It's too hard to see. Yeah, a little bit would be great. Thank you. I can see up here, so... All right, great. So. Here we are, uh, this, is, uh, this is school is just getting out. We're, we're in the, the, the town of Fluten, outside of Utrecht. And here we see children bicycling on their own. Some with parents, some with their grandparents, entire generations bicycling together. But the thing I just was struck with was this is children who are bicycling on their own. Their parents feel comfortable that they're gonna be safe uh, riding in streets. And that's because they have committed to designing low speed shared streets and a network of protected bike lanes or cycle tracks. I recently listened to two different talks. Uh, one was by a colleague named Ian Lockwood I work with. Others was a traffic engineer from the city of Rotterdam. And these were kind of their organizing principles when it comes to what makes good walkability and good bikeability. I think one thing that struck me as I hear these talks over and over again is so many common themes. We hear talking again and again about the importance, the importance of safety, but also the importance of comfort, the perception of safety, that we feel comfortable when we're walking and biking in our streets. Also this concept of continuous and connected networks, knowing where you're gonna go next, knowing that you have a, a curb ramp and a crosswalk, knowing where it connects you, those are really core principles. For me, at the heart of Complete Streets, however, is a recognition that we have an imbalance on our streets when it comes to safety. We have road users that are more vulnerable than other road users, and we need to take that into account when we plan and design our street networks. Bicyclists and pedestrians, uh, especially people who are slower walking, um, we are more vulnerable. We are more at risk of being injured in the event of a crash than a motor vehicle. Uh, and that fundamental insight needs to drive the way we think about our street network. So we are living in a really exciting time. There is more and more research and more and more attention being paid to this issue. Um, and that, that's really good for our field. Um, we're also in a time where we're kind of using flexibility and creativity um, to our benefit. On the right here, I know you're not meant to read it, but that's, um, that's, an, that's a memorandum issued from the uh, FHWA, the Federal Highways. It was very often that Federal Highways was seen as you know, the, one of the more conservative uh, engineering bodies, but their job is the freeways. Um, but they issued this memorandum that says, we encourage you to be creative and flexible when it comes to creating bicycle and pedestrian networks. And they actually cite the uh, NACTO Urban Street Design Guide, which is uh, big cities have come together to develop their own guidance. And the federal government recognizes we need to be creative, especially in constrained cities, 
when it comes to making uh, walkable and bikeable environments. I think the other thing we're realizing is that we need to be, we need to work together. We need to have integrated strategies. We need to think about how can we improve multiple modes at the same time when we look at all of our projects. So I want to talk about a couple of concepts. We've already alluded to them before. But I think the key concept is we don't have a limited space. We're not starting from scratch. We have very constrained streets. We have cherished buildings that we're not going to tear down to widen our roads. So we need to make the absolute best of every inch of road space that we can. So two concepts that are gaining currency are the road diet and the lane diet. The road diet says we need to look if there's a way to utilize our roadway space better. Many communities have found that the old uh, four-lane road, two lanes other direction, um, are actually very unsafe. You have cars making left turns from that center lane, a lot of cars rear-ending that car. So communities have found they can have streets that when they drop one of those travel lanes, add a turn lane in key places. Those roads can still operate efficiently, and they're much, much safer. And the benefit is you have extra space, which you can devote to your vulnerable user by creating bike lanes, cycle tracks, or wider sidewalks. Sometimes it's not feasible to remove a travel lane. We just have too much traffic to do it in the current situation. But we can look at narrowing our travel lanes. It used to be that we, it was understood, oh, if we go less than 12 feet, we're going to have a safety problem with our travel lanes. Um, luckily, this, this issue has seen a lot of attention. Um, I'm a member of what's called the Transportation Research Board, the TRB, and we work through something called the NCHRP, the National Cooperative Highway Research Program. Well, now we have research that says, yes, indeed, you can look at lanes less than 12 feet, even less than 11 feet in many cases, and still have the same safety as you had if you had wider lanes. And also, to Steve's point really about speed, if we narrow travel lanes, cars go slower. And that's a safety benefit for all of us, especially the vulnerable road users. So this is a graphic from the Boston Complete Streets Guidelines. And I think one of the important insights, too, is the relationship that streets have to the community life. Um, and corners and intersections are especially important. Uh, these are where people's paths cross. These are where bus routes intersect. It's where we have doors to important uh, uh, businesses and community places. Those are important places for the design of our streets where we want to think about reclaiming space from the roadway uh, to the sidewalk, putting sidewalk cafes, creating space for bike parking as we saw, or bus stops. Um, I also want to point out um, some design details that I feel are really important. Um, many times we design to the minimum. This is often true with pedestrian curb ramps. We have the ramp on the four feet wide minimum where we make the sidewalk, but that sidewalk can be 10 feet wide. We don't look at widening that ramp, make it generous. I think there's a perception that ramps are just for those people in mobility device in a wheelchair. We all benefit from having wide ramps. So the Boston Complete Streets Guidance actually recommends having that ramp, the width of the crosswalk, not go with that minimum, but have it nice and generous so you can walk side by side with someone uh, and use that ramp. So we've touched a little bit on parking. I know parking can be a very difficult discussion for a community. It's one that we have to have. And I think one of the good things now is we're getting more and more data, and data is our friend when it comes to parking. I think any effort needs to look at how we're using our parking spaces. Who is using them? Uh, what, are the, what are the purposes of the space? How long are they using that space? Um, it's also in an area where technology is coming to help us. Uh, on the right here is a screenshot from a new app uh, from a program the city of Boston is using uh, that tells you the availability of parking spaces per block. One of the things we know is that when parking is underpriced, when it's free um, or very inexpensive, people spend a lot of time circling trying to find that parking. There's a lot of negative effects on the quality of our community. People are driving a lot more, we have more congestion, we have more uh, chances for crashes and injury. So uh, parking is one of those areas where I think we're learning more how to use data to make our, our spaces more efficient, to make sure they're working um, as best as they can for the community. So talk a little bit about, about sidewalk design. I think in the past we thought of a sidewalk as it's just a strip, it's one thing. I think now we're trying to realize a sidewalk has its own different components. And these are kind of the, the four zones that we talk about in Boston. The frontage zone talks about how the sidewalk relates to the businesses. And this is critical because sidewalks are key to the success of our local economy. So thinking about how they interact with doors opening onto the streets, uh, potentially a place for sidewalk cafes where they have them. And then you have your pedestrian zone. And I think we want to think about how, we, how much space we have, how we anticipate our sidewalks to be used, 
providing enough space that people can uh, walk comfortably, you can talk to your friend, uh, pass another pedestrian without having to go in a single file, and also think very, uh, very hard about the materials we use, making sure that they are strong, that they're slip resistant, uh, that they're durable. Um, we also have that space between the curb and the pedestrian zone that more and more are thinking creatively about. And in Boston, we call this the green slate, the green scape slash furnacing zone. It's where you look at your bike parking. We're also going to talk about a little bit. It's also we talk about stormwater management. I think in this room, we all agree um, that climate change is with us. We've already felt the effects of flooding uh, in our communities. Um, and we need to learn how to make our streets part of the solution, uh, not part of the problem. So one of the key strategies is how do we use our streets to divert water from our pipes, contributing to overflow, contributing to flooding, and how do we have the water percolate through our streets? So this concept of permeability uh, is being tested in a lot of communities. Uh, this shows kind of four examples, again, uh, looking at using per permeable pavers for parking areas. Um, it can be difficult in roadways just because of the impact of motor vehicles, but parking areas can be a great place to do it. On the lower left, that furnishing zone is a great place to look at. Harvesting storm water uh, can help you infiltrate your street trees. The upper right shows the use of a structural soil, which actually is used to support the sidewalk. And instead of having a solitary tree pit, it allows you to have soil underneath the entire length of the sidewalk, which allows trees to grow much stronger uh, and much more vitally. And then on the bottom right, um, in use in plazas or larger open spaces. A lot of complete streets is about getting the details right. Uh, before these guidelines, Boston had a standard design for street pit, which was uh, five feet by five feet. And what that meant is on very narrow sidewalks, the tree pit took up a lot of that space you want reserved for walking. So through the guidelines, we worked with the parks department and uh, developed a new standard where we now have a rectangular tree pit. So we still have the same soil volume for the trees, but we allow a lot more, a lot more space for the pedestrian zone. I also mentioned these integrated strategies. This is a great example of using a curb extension, which improves pedestrian mobility, um, visibility, it reduces crossing distance, also used here as a bioswale. So you see we're achieving multiple benefits uh, in, in a single design. The, the last thing I'll talk about, this is, this is kind of technical, but I think it's important because when these trees dug it down to the nitty gritty of traffic engineering, um, we know a lot about how motor vehicles operate, or how they accelerate, decelerate. We also know a lot about pedestrians. One of the core things we know is that we don't like to wait to cross the street. <laughs> and we know some research. So on the left here is a score A through F. Those numbers are seconds. And what we know is if you ask pedestrians to wait too long to cross the street, they're not going to wait. Motor vehicles will wait. They may not like it, but they're not going to run that red light. This is a very important uh, insight that we need to take into account when we're designing our signals to make sure that we have safe streets that are also convenient and comfortable. But I want to move close by a story illustrating how some of these principles were applied on real life to a project in Boston by talking about Massachusetts Avenue in Back Bay. Um, these were the before conditions, um, very unsafe, people weaving in and out of traffic. We looked closely at the data and realized we had a public health problem. All those dots are people being uh, injured in crashes, bicycles crashing with motor vehicles. Now, they're not riding a mass app because they want to get hurt. They're riding because they want to go to school, they want to get home, they want to go to work. That's the only street they can travel. No other street provides that access. Mass app is also a key street for transit. The number one bus, the most heavily used bus in the city, uh, connects, connects numerous, uh, numerous transit stations, shown here. So we looked at the on-street parking. We did a very detailed analysis, looked at how the parking was being used, how many spaces were on either side of the street, and ultimately, because of the importance of Mass Ave for regional transportation, for mobility, for traffic, it was determined that removing parking was, was the most feasible option to create a better safe conditions for cyclists. So this was the existing cross-section at this location. We had 10-foot parking lanes that turned into turn lanes in location, 10-foot travel lanes, uh, two in each direction. So our proposal was pretty standard. We looked at it, well, let's, let's widen the parking lane on one side to eight feet. Um, we'll add a five-foot bike lane. Let's widen that travel lane to 11 feet to allow for buses. MBTA buses, 10 and a half feet, you know, outside of mirror and outside. But as I mentioned, this street is really important for transit operations, also for vehicle operations. This might be a little hard to see. This is a final, the engineering detail. This is really where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. What we realized is that by just having a five-foot bike lane, is this my pointer here? Okay. We were going to have a problem with the buses. 
what we did is we actually widened the bike lane to five and a half feet, added the buffer, so we have an eight feet buffered bike lane. We didn't do that to make the bicycles more comfortable, that's a really nice benefit. We did that so the MBTA bus could pull all the way out of traffic, uh, not partially block adjacent travel lane, and you could still have two travel lanes moving through. So there's, you see the final condition. Again, it's, it's not perfect. Complete streets are never uh, completely perfect. But we have a situation where the bus can pull mostly out of that traffic. Now it's important to note that we're not done. We're not satisfied with this. Uh, the city has a bicycle master plan, as, as was indicated. Uh, the city's vision for the street is create protected, uh, separated cycle tracks, look at widening that sidewalk, and further optimizing the parking. But these are the conditions now. It's, it's much more comfortable uh, for all those users. Um, that completes my presentation. So thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you all. That was uh, inspiring and um, perhaps uh, gave folks here more questions than, uh, than we'll have answers for. But let's, um, let's start off. We'll, we'll start by taking questions from the audience. Uh, Mitch. I'll start with a uh, comment slash suggestion. You didn't talk so much about how parking takes up a huge amount of our infrastructure and how much space we do up to that. I'll throw out an idea to our, our replying officials and uh, replying citizens in general, which is I would love to see the east side of Harvard Street from Beacon up to the Crossing take away the parking in the summer and expand out the sidewalk space like they do in the back city. Put dollars where the parking is and double the width of the sidewalk. Okay. Any response or? Well, I, I, just, I just say something. I, I really like the idea of trying things. I think um, if you look at New York City and the, the transformation they've been able to achieve, it was probably done because they were willing to do things quick, uh, do it cheaply at first, uh, to test ideas. And I think that's a really powerful notion. So I, I, I like your concept of, of the test. I, I second that. I think all of us who've been around for a while have experienced uh, pedestrian zones in downtown areas that didn't actually work. Uh, because it took away some of the diversity of act actions going on there. So I think when you do those kinds of things, I agree, you really need to pilot them and make sure everybody's on board. Otherwise, you run into a political problem that you didn't expect. And for reasons that don't make any sense, you end up not being able to continue to do it. The other really important thing is that the bugaboo about parking, especially in commercial areas, people think, my customers all get to me. I'll lose my customer base. And it would be worth your while to do a little survey of customers going in and out of stores. My prediction is a much lower percentage drove directly to the store. And many more parked further away and either walked or walked the entire way or biked the entire way. And this has been found true in city after city around the country. Central Square. George mentioned lots of parking if you can find it. All the parking's off the square. And people are happy to park a block away and walk. And that, from a business perspective, is even better because you're more likely to stop at two stores. If you've got a big shop, you drive to the suburban malls, you get your big furniture, you stick it in the back. It's one shot, it's real heavy. A lot of our shopping in downtowns is a lot of small things. A piece here, a piece there, that store. I don't need the park each time. In fact, I'd rather go somewhere else if I have to park each time. So parking turns out to be much more ambiguous in terms of business success than the common mythology tends, and it's worth the experiment to see. Okay, Anne. I know everybody out there, and I would like to thank Dick especially because he challenged all of us to come up with complete streets that fit for clients. I live in Brookline. I've lived here for 12 years. I live on Hart Street, in the middle of Workman's Cottage. And I work on the medical campus. I'm an academic, like many people, in Brookline. And I studied the bicycle for 32 years. That's all I do. I got my PhD and continue the research on bicycle facilities. We did research on walking and biking. And biking is much healthier compared to walking. Because if you walk slowly, and 50% of the nurses in 18,414 nurses walk slowly, they gain weight as they walk slowly. <laughs> so when you build a really wide sidewalk, it's a good idea, it sounds like it's good for economic development, we're 
right beside the Harvard Medical Campus, we're making people fatter so they then go back to the medical campus when they're <laughs> because they have diabetes, stroke, or cancer. So we want to make people as healthy as possible. Brookline is also attracting so many families that we now have to look at our school system. Where are we going to put all the families? Complete Streets to me is great, and everybody up there agrees with this in some way. Complete Streets tries to get people to walk and to bike, which is better than just major highways. The flaw is there's a huge disconnect between the goal of Complete Streets, which is to serve every bicyclist and every walker and every car driver, no matter the age or the ability, meaning all bicyclists, all ages, and yet that's not the realization of the Complete Streets that we get. So a lot of the photographs that you saw had a bike lane in the door zone. That is much less safe compared to a cycle track. Cycle track, sidewalk, curb step down where the parallel park cars are, slide those out. Cycle tracks have a 28% lower injury rate compared to biking in the road, 2.5 times as many bicyclists in the cycle track compared to the road. Research on the door zone bike lanes in New York City said the bike lanes are safer. If you read table three, again, a room full of academics, I'm assuming they're all associated in some way with academics because we're work line. <laughs> If you look at table three, you find that the bike lanes in the door zone are safer for the car drivers and safer for the pedestrians, but less safe for the bicyclists. So in Brookline, we should be looking at complete streets and understanding the goal is right to get as many people as possible, women, children, seniors, and parents with children on their bicycles bicycling so that they're all healthier. And all of the research now, including the Green Money Project, out of Portland State, including the new Federal Highway Administration called the proposal that just is going to come out from North Carolina Chapel Hill, and including all the other studies that say cycle tracks are by and far the most preferred and the safest, and we don't need to have all the parallel park cars on the side of the street, especially in unique Brookline, where you can't park on the street overnight. Thank you. Okay. Hopefully you all heard that, because I don't think I can repeat it, but we have a few themes there, biking, walking, and health, constrained space, and in which you know we have to, to allocate somehow, and bike lanes in the door zone, uh, if there are any comments from our panel. Steve. Uh, there, there's a lot of analysis now about where and what conditions make bicyclists feel safe. And Anne's totally correct. If you have a certain threshold of volume of traffic, or of speed of traffic, there's absolutely no question a, a real bike road, like a pedestrian road, is clearly the safest way to go. My only concern is that we then think, oh, we have to do that kind of thing on every road. And we don't. It's important to remember some of the pictures I showed. Quiet residential streets, like the one I grew up in, those are complete streets. You don't need a cycle track on a street that's already quiet you may need to control access on either side. Remember the picture of the one-way road, two-way bikes, or the chicanes? So there may be other treatments that are more appropriate on low traffic residential roads. But where there's traffic, where there's heavy volume, where there's a lot of people coming, cycle tracks are clearly your preferred method if you can get, get them in. Great, thank you. Uh, the gentleman in the third row with green shirt. I don't think I've heard a word about handicapped people or mothers pushing baby carriages. Mm -hmm. There's so much of this around that I, I think some mention should be made if there anything we're not thinking about. Okay, folks with disabilities in wheelchairs or moms or dads pushing strollers. Dads, but I like that one, thank you. <laughs> Yeah. This, this cord is pretty short, so I wanted to share that one. Uh, a couple things. I, it, in all of this, it's really important. I'm going to repeat what Nick said, <coughs> thinking about you know the ramps going onto sidewalks and you know making that accessible for everyone to get on and off. But I think the the theme with all of this in complete streets is that it makes it. A, more inviting for everyone. And so when I showed the picture of Chris Hart with his wheel off of you know, the sidewalk, that's because the sidewalk is way too skinny and because there's a tree and the tree root is growing, you now create 
a completely uninviting sidewalk um, where he often is going down the middle of Tremont Street in downtown Boston in his wheelchair because it's better to do that where it's flat and wide open and get up, stay on the sidewalk. And so with all of these themes, I think um, it rings true with instead of seeing mothers pushing their baby carriages in the shoulder, um, there's actually a wide enough sidewalk where you could take you know, a baby carriage and um, you can use a wheelchair to get around and actually see people using wheelchairs out on our streets and making it again not where they people have to be inside because they're you know injured or have you know something else um, lifelong. So. Yeah, I'll just um, I'll just add one more design concept. I think that's really important for especially for those people using mobility devices and pushing children in in, in, um, in strollers. There was a concept earlier of of the raised crosswalk, and um, you know for better or worse in Boston we get a fair amount of rain and we get snow. And for all those um, of you who walk, you know where does that rain tend to pool? It's right at the base of that curb ramp where it meets the street. Um, you know, those who are able-bodied, we can jump over that. Um, if you're in a wheelchair, you're pushing a stroller, you have no option but to go through that puddle. And if it's, if it's the winter, that's gonna be ice. So I think the genius of the raised crosswalk is that you don't have that problem with the water pooling and ponding at the bottom of that ramp. Now, it doesn't mean it's easy, you often have to address um, how the water flows around the curbs. You might have to move potentially pipes, uh, inlets, but I think that's a really important concept that can make our street more accessible uh, for all users. Uh, let's see. Uh, some questions from this side of the room. Yes, Ken. Okay. Some of the changes that we're making, we notice the use of grid pavers, and uh, especially if they're um, on sand, they tend to heave over time and pose uh, difficulties for folks uh, who have, um, you know, issues walking or in wheelchairs or whatever. Uh, alternative designs. I know there there are some uh, other technologies that are used to create a similar looking surface. Yeah, I think there's there's two things. One is I, I think you're you're very right. I think. Um, People who do not have those, um, not using wheelchairs, don't appreciate the amount of vibration and the pain and discomfort that can be caused by an uneven surface. Um, I think a lot of communities now are looking at using, um, you know, perhaps more, more toward concrete in the pedestrian zone, and they're using that brick paper and that accent zone. But it, uh, I think Scott's right. There's also a lot to do with uh, with the construction. Um, Actually, as part of the Boston guidelines, we did um, we did a test of different styles of pavers. We went over to Kendall Square and had numerous people who use wheelchairs testing different pavements, and actually found that uh, pavers made from asphalt they don't look like asphalt; they can be dyed. Um, tended to be uh, much more comfortable for people uh, using mobility devices than, than other materials. What about porous paving? I know uh, you know there's a the movement toward porous paving for stormwater purposes, and how does that? Uh, stack up with regard to accessibility? Uh, well, I can, in, in a lot of our, m most of our work is urban and we struggle with all these <coughs> issues as we do buildings and we need to do crosswalks and all these other things. Uh, the comments about, uh, I, I think, and coming back to the question here about how do you design this for people with disabilities, permanent or temporary, whatever. I think there's a principle called universal design, which we use in buildings around handicap accessibility and other sorts of access issues. And that's really the principle we should be talking about throughout the livable city, because if it's, if it's good for everybody, it's good for everybody. And I think the way you decide whether something works well is you actually test it as you're talking about, because wider ramps and crosswalks are easier to walk on when you're walking with people, pushing a stroller or various other things as well as for someone who happens to be in a wheelchair. And these principles are relatively easy, although in New England we have lots of 
constraints of sizes of spaces and hills and those things we have to deal with, but it, it's a doable solution. Uh, in terms of um, the uh, permeable pavings, uh, those are something that we use quite a lot. They have a lot of operational issues around them, so I think uh, we have to be careful where they use them because they require a certain amount of maintenance. I'm not aware that they actually present any issues regarding, any significant issues regarding uh, impediments to movement. Okay, thank you. Uh, in the structure. Uh, thank you. I, um, I enjoyed the, the forum. I just wanted to make a comment about uh, the Netherlands. I travel there on business quite a bit. And they, they do have very safe um, roads and, and fantastic access to bicycles. But they also do things that I haven't seen in Boston, and that is include uh, giving bicyclists citations, like 75 euro citations for violating crosswalk and violating rules, and there's, uh, there's incredible standards of, of, of decency by bicyclists in Amsterdam that in Boston, at least my observation, I don't want to criticize everybody on the bike, but, but there are some bicyclists in Boston who don't care about traffic patterns, they just do whatever they want. And I've never ever seen a bicyclist get a citation. I have. You should hang out uh, on the hub app. Yeah. Yes. There, there actually is a, a new concerted effort, to be clear. Part of what's going on, I think, I mean, there are some jerks out there on bicycles. I mean, you know, let's be honest, there's also jerks on the sidewalk and jerks in cars. So this seems to be a human problem. <laughs> But the, the big thing about the bicyclists, and your perception is not unusual, is that for years we have defined bike riding as a high risk, slightly crazy thing to do. We've treated it that way, the way we structured our streets. So why are we surprised that the people who became bicyclists were slightly crazy and high risk takers? <laughs> I mean, who else would do it? What we're now doing is bringing the mainstream, not everybody, but let's say another 30%, 20% of people in the population become, not every day, but often enough, it changes the entire social tone of the bicycle community. So there are sections now, for example, on Hampshire Street going from Somerville through Cambridge into downtown Boston, there are bike jams in the morning. Literally, you have to wait two light cycles to get through, okay? And when someone comes through and tries to run the light, it's the cyclists who start yelling at the guy. And it's a guy. And, uh, so I think partly what's going to happen is being enforced, and I just don't see it. When it stops being something that's crazy to do, you stop getting crazy people to do it. I'm glad it's because the quality of the bicycles go off. You know, you don't have the solo crazy leaving out of traffic. You've got 60 people on land. Right, safety. Uh, there was a fellow over here, excuse me. Okay, continue. This is really important. I'm married to a bicycle commuter. And he was a soft spoken, gentle southerner until he started commuting in Boston. And the reason I say this is because he's been hit by pedestrians, he's been adored by people. I've taught my kids to be defensive riders with bicyclists, which means go in front of the car. So I think that you have to consider the fact that when you're driving in a car, you're exactly to how many pounds of metal. Fill in the back right here. You've been waiting a while. No. Me? With the white shirt, yes. So I, I was just curious whether any of the panelists had any thoughts on educating drivers. I ride in Brookline a lot, and, and I ride on Beacon Street a lot, and the bike lane comes and goes. And when I'm not on the bike lane, probably once every two weeks, somebody honks at me and is mad at me because I'm using a lane, which I'm allowed to do. Um, and have really no other choice. So I'm just wondering about whether there's something we can do just in terms of educating um, people who are driving, you know, that 
bicycles are allowed to use the lane, and it's not that I'm just a kook who's out on a bicycle and these roads are for cars. A lot of interest in, in bikes tonight. Um, discontinuous infrastructure and uh, having to uh, share the road. Yes. So continuing the conversation too from the Netherlands to this point. Um, so I actually lived in the Netherlands for three years when I was a kid and went to Dutch Montessori school. And when I was six, I was allowed to ride to school, ride home for lunch. Um, the whole education is very different there in terms of learning to bike. They have these um, amazing traffic gardens where you're, as a kid, you're getting to like bike and also be like in a fake car and learn how to navigate on the road. But the amazing thing about education is at that young age and then where you can't get your driver's license until you're 18. First you get a scooter, then you get your driver's license. Um, but for the most part, um, still my friends there still don't have a driver's license and they biked all the way through, is that everyone has that experience of what it means to be a person biking. And that tension of you know bike versus car just doesn't exist. And so to your point, um, we need to have this full rounded out plans that we often talk about the six E's. It's both engineering and the infrastructure that we're talking about it. If you build it, they will come. Um, and then with that, education, enforcement, encouragement, um, equity, and evaluation to really you know, make it work. And right now, it's very uncomfortable when we have these discontinuous you know, segments and you have these little strips of bike lanes and then they just end. And often they end right in an intersection, which is the worst, because <laughs> that's the most dangerous where people are turning and lots of things are happening. Um, but it's all the more reason why we need this infrastructure. We need to create these bike networks. We need to actually implement and fund these bike network plans so that we can start to have this you know, continuity. We need to connect our greenways. And then as more people are biking, more children are being educated. There's a lot of work that's being done by a couple organizations around um, updating uh, RMV and driver's manuals and driver's tests, and also doing um, education with police as well as MBTA bus drivers. Um, Mass Bike and Walk Boston have been doing a lot of work around this um, and can also provide more like, specific information. So again, I just want to emphasize that it's all of these different pieces. And the ultimate goal of all of this and the vision is, as we're all out there, it becomes about people. And people, all of us who sometimes choose to drive, and sometimes choose to walk, sometimes bike, sometimes take transit, and you don't then have that tension of you know, car versus bike. We should stop saying cyclist. We should stop saying driver. You know, I, I'm not a cyclist. I'm a person who chooses to bike on some days <laughs> to get to where I need to go. Um, and that, that concept of give respect and get respect um, is hugely important too to, to spread. All right, thank you. We just have uh, a little more time for questions. Uh, I'll, I'll take three more because we're going to get kicked out of the space and, and I want to make sure we, we don't uh, stay over time uh, too much and, and want to also give a chance to uh, Frank Carrot to, to make a closing remark. Um, so uh, I, the couple of folks have had their hands up for a while. Um, Brian, Marilise, and I'm sorry, don't your name. Yep. Mika. Mika. Okay. Um, so just a quick comment. I just want to ask a little bit about Route Nine. So we have a state highway that runs through, and so just picking up on some of the comments about you know incomplete lanes and. End, I mean, the big problem is that you have these cars that are zooming in at like 60 miles an hour, and then all of a sudden there's traffic lights and they're turning off onto these kind of small streets and going way too fast, and it creates a lot of problems. How do we work with state DOT? What is your experience with the state government level DOT people to get them to change what they're doing with Route 9, where they, they just have this mindset of how do we move cars faster through Route 9 through Brookline, we really need to get them to change their whole mindset, slow those cars down so that when they get to Brookline, they're already moving at this pace that they should be moving for the streets of Brookline. The uh, tension between cars trying to get through Brookline and maybe into it, and uh, what's happening on either side of, of Route 9. <coughs> 
this room was the beginning. Matt Scott, like all traffic uh, departments, has a lot of flexibility. What's traditionally been done is to figure out to use that flexibility on the assumption your job is to move cars fast, as many as possible. There's a cultural change now that MassDOT officially, and many of their engineers, and I'm sure some of the same thing is true in the, in the town departments as well, would like to do different. One problem they're facing is we have 100 years of infrastructure that's in concrete moving you in one direction, sends one message to cars. There are ways to begin to change that, but it's not going to happen until this group makes it really clear it's a political decision. This is not a technical decision. They have the flexible legal right to make some changes in the road, whether it be bumps or lights or narrowing. There's a lot of ways to do a tightening corner so you can't come around so fast. It's not going to happen because they have so many other things they have to do. This is not going to go to the top of their priority list until you, politically, tell them it's important. That, that's what's going to make it happen. I think people are open. Engineers want to do the right thing. They've got too much on their plate. So you have to help them make this more of a priority. I'm I sorry to the engineers about that. I tell you that I've already emailed MassDOT. I don't know, maybe about 80 individuals in all of MassDOT. We got all of the emails back from MassDOT. They were passed on to Brookline transportation officials. MassDOT is now in favor of cycle tracks for the gateway east project. Right, well, thank you for that news. MassDOT now in favor of cycle tracks for gateway east. Uh, if you guys demand it. Um, and Steve, just to follow up on, on your comment, with Route 9 in particular, I mean, if, if, the, if you're trying to relieve a bottleneck, or if you can strain something on, on that section of Route 9, say, that goes through what's Brookline, what is Brookline Village, um, uh, the cars are just going through and they're just going to hit another constraint down the line, and so speed doesn't necessarily equal throughput in cases like this, right? One of the things, and George might know more about this even than I, uh, that in Central Square, when they narrowed the road and took away lanes, the throughput, the cars being able to go through per hour afterwards was the same as it was before. They went slower, but by adjusting the traffic lights, at least the story I'm told, they were able to keep people moving just as well. I think there was also a, a role where some people decided, I really do want to go fast, and they went someplace else, and goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> I would also just note that the effect of eliminating a, a traveling lane eliminated double parking entirely. There is no more. Right. Uh, narrowly seeking way. Um, I hope this doesn't, isn't too much off topic. I think it's directly relevant. Part of making an area pedestrian friendly is improving the aesthetics. Um, improving the aesthetics seems to make the area more upscale. Uh, I think of Central Square, and I think it is serving a different class than it was serving previously. And I'm wondering to what degree can we avoid uh, gentrification as a result of making our streets more friendly? Excellent question, thank you. Well, since you said Central Square, I guess I have to say something. <laughs> I think there's a difference between um, friendly and upscale, first of all. Uh, the visioning process that we've gone through in Cambridge around Central Square, and Kendall for that matter. In Central Square, the vision, the underlying mantra of the vision uh, that we came up with is that grit is good because it's part of the character of what Central Square is. So we are struggling with this issue of how do you make improvements, make it friendlier, perhaps make it more aesthetic, uh, and yet keep it as uh, curiously uh, gritty as it is now. And one of the things, as, a, as an architect, I will tell you, I think sign control is the killer of energetic, vital communities. It's unnecessary. Uh, it just homogenizes everything and takes away some of that aesthetic interest. You mean like storefronts? <laughs> yes. We don't do that here. I just want to point out that this um, 
The concept of displacement is a huge issue that's just is is bubbling now, you know, again, and so um, there's a lot of people that and groups that are now thinking about this seriously and. It's tough coming from a transportation angle where you're trying to give people options so that they actually can, you know, not have to pay for a car and get around um, and be able to afford living in the city. Um, but we're dealing with this tension that there's this flood back to cities where there's services and there's education and there's culture and there's access to all of these things. Um, and what needs to happen is work with housing, land use, zoning, and it becomes much beyond, Are we? It's, it's not about are we putting in a bike facility or are we widening a sidewalk. It's a lot of other triggers and there's a lot of groups and coalitions that are now forming to think about these issues um, and think about what will change um, as everyone wants to live here. And naturally our you know, open housing market prices, they're just going up and up and up. So it's a great point that we need to be thinking about, but it, it shouldn't be equated to not doing these transportation improvements that are doing exactly what is trying to overcompensate that of like, now you don't have to live in a car and you don't have to pay hundreds of dollars a month um, to just upkeep a car and pay for parking. Right. And the final comment or question, Mika. My name is Mika Shizuma. I have a bias. I've been raised in the for 20 years. Um, the main thing I've noticed is, like, like Jackie said, it's attitude. Being raised from, from day one with bikes in traffic, you automatically check and drive them. This is where they are. And I think that's going to be one of the difficult things here, for, for mostly for drivers to realize they're not personal. Uh, but I know that's bike act. Uh, and what the question I actually have is a lot of these improvements are nice on paper and implemented, but a large chunk that's not the discussion to enforce them. The double parkers that the cars that you drive in for parking, um, the, the sidewalks that don't get shoveled or are overgrown the gardens, no matter how wide they are. Um, how does that, uh, is there going to be change in that? Is there going to be uh, a lot of police presence, better education? Well, I, I'm, I'm not going to um, have, I think, the, 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 the silver bullet for that issue, but I do think a lot of concepts uh, that we're coming to realize is that we need to design spaces that are better at self-enforcing. I think the great example of the parking and the bike lane, I think one of the great benefits of the cycle track is that you can't park in it. There's a physical protection from doing that. And I think we recognize that we have a problem with speeding our community, and that's one of the most persistent issues that we have. It's very hard to change because our streets are designed to encourage a higher rate of speed. So we're always gonna need more enforcement, more and more enforcement because the design of our roads is encouraging that behavior. So I do think that uh, enforcement's important, um, right? But I, I do fundamentally believe that good design can help reduce the need uh, for enforcement as well. I think this, goes, this also goes back to a previous comment about uh, driver's attitudes on the street, but also, attitudes of bicyclists towards pedestrians and pedestrians who step out in the middle of things and that the mutual respect piece. Um, I think numbers count so that the more people who are bike on their bikes out there and the more we build a structure that encourages walking, the more drivers, including those of us who bike and drive, get used to the presence of the bicyclists there. It becomes part of what you expect when you get into the car, as opposed to something that surprises you each time. What are they doing here, right? Of course they're there. They're there all the time. I think that's one piece. The second piece that's really, really important is setting a cultural tone. Now that's partly all of you talking to your friends. It's not allowing certain conversations to happen. It's the way, for example, in another environment, when somebody near you makes a homophobic joke, instead of sort of getting annoyed and walking away, you say that's not funny. It's a kind of a pushiness about saying, we need to work together on this. But the other piece of that working together is you need your town leaders, and in some ways you're part of that world, but the official town leaders, to make it clear that we're all in this together. 
When Mayor Menino announced the car is no longer king in Boston, there was a whole lot of people who, they may not have agreed with him, but suddenly that became a social norm. And you shut up. And I think we need to be doing that. We need our leaders to help change the tone of public conversation. So it's not about griping, who are these newcomers on our streets? It's about how do we work together? Everybody belongs here. This is all of our streets. It's a public space. And I think that's something to be thinking about as you go forward too. Great, thank you. And you know, speaking of leaders, uh, I often describe Brookline as being democracy on steroids. There's one big group of folks that I left out in my acknowledgments at the beginning. Town meeting members. Everybody raise your hand. Okay, and probably a lot more than that. So uh, let's give them all a hand. So thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Frank just to, to close it out. Please do join us at Orinoco down the street, 22 Harbor, afterward. And um, thanks so much. Yeah, I just want to say a couple of words in closing. Uh, not so long ago when I was uh, you know, first uh, heard, heard the term uh, complete streets and complete streets policy being Kind of described, I you know kind of recognized. Well, that's not a term that you know, I was accustomed to hearing in the discourse in, in Brookline. Then I you know heard well, you know, communities that had complete street policies were making had part of their capital improvement plans. They were making improvements in sidewalks. They were uh, doing um, uh, controlling speed of automobiles with speed bumps and. Uh, and, and like, and you know, also know well, Brookline has a long-term investment in street trees, and you know, certainly doing some nice things uh, to make the corner attractive. So you know, I said, well, you know, we don't, you know, we're doing it, but but uh, we're not using the term. And then uh, I, you know, I learned that uh, some some communities have adopted formal com complete street policies. I also learned. Uh, that the legislature has uh, an, an enacted some legislation which is going to provide communities that have complete street policy uh, with um, to, to be eligible for some grant funds that only they are available for to advance their uh, their complete streets initiative. And then, then I was then kind of interested in seeing well, what what some of these complete streets policies look like that some communities have adopted. And, and uh, I you know, got access to, to some of them. And then I saw, well, the most interesting ones uh, were, were communities that, that not only had a kind of a policy statement where there was a vision, and, you know, kind of, you know, and obviously had been a good deal of community discussion about what was in kind of incorporated in that vision, but they also had entities kind of built into it whose mission was to keep working on it, to make sure that those principles were being applied on an ongoing basis. And you know, then it kind of occurs to me, yeah, in Brookline, you know, we have here and there, we have some great things that are going. Uh, and, but we've also had an enormous number of skirmishes and sometimes around small projects, kind of to try to kind of do some of these things bicycle improvements, pedestrian improvements, kind of whatever. And, and in a sense, the, 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 you could say, well, the kind of the reason for our bring together this, this, um, uh, this forum this evening is to begin a discussion in Brookline about, first of all, uh, can we get a shared vision where we're really kind of coming together on a kind of a high level uh, to, uh, to see whether there some ideas that we can can share, and then you know, can, can we uh, come together around a, a, a way to really to carry that forward on a continuing basis? And so, what we're we're hoping is that this is really just the first of a number of, di of discussions of these issues. This evening, we deliberately did this, so we were kind of talking about complete streets in general, example from other places. We were not doing it to, to be 
uh, critically looking at uh, specific features of Brookline. Uh, and we, we hope that you'll be interested in being part of this discussion as, as, we, as we go forward. We hope that some of us will come together around, you know, around Brookline formulating and adopting a complete street policy. Uh, so um, we, we're going to be in touch with you and, and encourage you to come to future forums and hope that some of you will pick up on this and we'll be carrying it forward. Thank you.